Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thrilled to uh, spend a few minutes with Rev, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the role of AI in uh, industrial automation. You know, we've uh, spent a lot of time talking uh, here and demonstrating on the show floor the uh, really how we're creating the future of industrial operations. And you know, at dinner last night, talking to really a, a diverse representation of different types of industries, it was remarkable how big a role that uh, artificial intelligence plays in uh, each of their visions of what their operations could look like. Yeah, what, what we're experiencing right now with the introduction to, of artificial intelligence um, may be a little bit discombobulating and, and confusing to some, uh, but in some sense it's actually quite simple. A, a little over a decade ago with the invention of this new kind of uh, software development, what we're calling AI or machine learning, we, we introduced the possibility of solving computing problems, of creating software and algorithms that we had no, no way of creating before. We had been trying to do, uh, we had been trying to solve problems like image classification and computer vision for decades and had just failed to do so uh, in a robust way. All of a sudden, with this new invention, the, the concept of having software write the algorithms for us by us giving it lots of examples of what we would like it to do, we now have unlocked the possibility of, of creating algorithms we, we just didn't imagine we'd be able to, to do beforehand. And where we think that this is going to be the most applicable, where it's going to be the most valuable, is in applying this computing to things related to the physical world around us, to the world of atoms, not just the world of one, ones and zeros and knowledge work. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we're so excited here to, to, uh, to be here at Automation Fair and work with Rockwell to connect uh, the world of computers, algorithms, and the power of AI in this new kind of software to the physical world through the bridge that Rockwell provides. Yeah, you know, and when we look at opportunities for uh, where Rockwell is focusing our efforts on uh, artificial intelligence, um, you know, you mentioned the word, and it's simplification. A lot of the things that uh, we're applying AI to are to simplify the whole business of designing systems, to be able to commission those systems through simulation, to be able to operate and maintain them in a predictive way. You, know, you talked about machine vision, and I can remember you know, old use cases where it was just too hard to hard code the classification systems for sorting tile or looking for imperfections on a metal painted surface and things like that. And AI really gives us that opportunity to be able to take a frame from whatever camera is being used, but to look at it as a very sophisticated sensor and to process it at speed on a line or in a, in a piece of equipment. So really simplification, I think, is that, uh, is that common thread. Um, another example of simplification is on display at the show, and that's use of uh, co-pilots to be able to uh, uh, allow a operator or an engineer to use natural language to program logics controller. So this is a real world example that's here today. People say, is this in the future? No, it's here today and it's gonna allow people to not have to worry about the arcane syntax you know, of um, you know, ladder logic um, if they prefer to program using natural language and to pull from uh, you know, models to be able to take library code and to put it together. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of examples uh, and uh, you know, another one is uh, the subject of the recent announcement that we made uh, about our collaboration. And that's really um, you know, use of uh, embedded APIs within our Emulate 3D simulation tools uh, to be able to uh, transport those models to the Omniverse. Uh, yes, we, we're very excited about this collaboration and um, what NVIDIA does fundamentally is we build computers, we build computing systems, we build core technology, but we don't build applications and solutions ourselves. 
Uh, for that, we rely on our partners, our ecosystem partners, such as Rockwell, to take our computing technologies and, and actually turn it into something useful that solves real problems for others. Um, we, we deeply believe in the power of simulation, and the simulation of physical things as a company because we use simulation ourselves to build our chips. We've been using it since the very beginning of NVIDIA. We're about 32 years old now. Um, before we tape out our chips, before we send the, act, the file that uh, represents all of the, the design and the transistors and layout of the chip for it to be fabricated, uh, we have simulated it uh, in every possible configuration emulated, actually running applications on that, so much so that we're certain that when that first chip comes back, it's going to work. And it's really the only way we can build such a complex thing. We have billions and billions of transistors in there. It's so complex, it's impossible to have thousands of designers get it right the first time without first testing it inside, inside a simulation environment. We believe the same is necessary for all things we build in the real world and the things that we're building in the real world are becoming more complex, especially as they become imbued with more computing, with more intelligence. The, the factories we're, we're building, the warehouses, the products themselves are, are becoming more and more complex. The only way we're gonna be able to do this right, do it efficiently, have a uh, good time to market, not waste materials and energy, is by ensuring that the way we do it is done well from the start, and that's through simulation. So what we're building with Omniverse is a core set of technologies that allow us to build large-scale simulations that leverage the computers and the computing systems that NVIDIA is good at building. And we're integrating that in, into Rockwell's applications and technologies. The first one is Emulate 3D. Very, very exciting because we think that this this is not just a, a nice to have thing, but it's essential for us to get to the next, uh, next wave of uh, the next industrial revolution, which is all about automation and applying intelligence to, to the complex systems we're, we're going to build. Yeah, you know, interest really uh, accelerated in this technology during the pandemic, because if you think about the commissioning process, you know, in the example that was being shown in the graphic of a, a bottling line, for instance, whether it's soap or soda pop or, or beer, you couldn't have at that time people, you know, representing, uh, you know, each of the pieces of equipment, deep how, you know, conveyor, labeler, filler, bottle washer, all the different pieces of equipment, um, probably from different companies. It just physically wasn't possible that you were going to be able to bring everybody shoulder to shoulder in a normal commissioning process. And so the idea of being able to remotely commission and to develop digital twins of the different pieces of equipment, being able to aggregate them, for instance, in the Omniverse, you know, is something that people started recognizing because it was, it was necessity to be able to turn to digital tools there. And so we're seeing companies like First Solar, as they're using Emulate 3D to de-bottleneck you know, their um, lines uh, making solar cells, solar panels. Uh, you see UPS as they embark on their digitization journey and their operations, looking at using Emulate 3D and talking with NVIDIA, and we had some conversations last night. And so you see it across a really diverse group of, um, you know, vertical industries and different users, equipment builders and users, who are recognizing that that simulation can save time, it can pull the commissioning to the left, so to speak, on the project timeline, and you can work out different options of workflow um, digitally, uh, think of it as in a gym, as opposed to wasting huge amounts of material, you know, physically having to, uh, to try it out. So um, we're seeing it here, and a lot of the technologies uh, on the show are, are proof that this is uh, really catching fire. I guess, you know, you've also talked about some of the other issues from a technology standpoint that, uh, that makes simulation interesting. You've mentioned before when we've talked about the three computer problem. Well, this, this fair that we're at is about automation, and where automation is going is autonomy. Um, up 
today, most of the automation we have is, is um, kind of a fixed set of systems that are coordinated kind of explicitly. But increasingly, what we're going to have is components inside these systems that are autonomous, that are kind of thinking for themselves and adapting to the situation around them. It's essentially agents in the real world, or robots, uh, that, that can do a few things. Um, what a robot is essentially is a, a system in the real world that can perceive the world around it. It can use computer vision and a set of sensors to kind of understand what's going on, uh, make some decisions, and autonomously plan what it's going to do, and eventually actuate. In order to build these systems, uh, we need, we need a, a lot of technology, and we need three types of computers. Mostly when we think about robots, you, we think about computing in the context of robots, we think about the computer that's in the robot. Uh, there's the computer inside an AMR, or the one that's driving a pick-and-place arm, or a self-driving car as a type of robot that you might think of. But um, in, in reality, that's actually the last computer. When building and operating this robot, before you can use that computer, you need to develop the software that's going to run on that computer, essentially the brain of the robot. Uh, and for that, uh, today, with the new way of developing software through machine learning and AI, we need a very different computer to generate the brain. We need an AI factory. So, so there's, that's our second computer, is the AI factory computer. Uh, but the lesser known computer that you also need is a computer that, that can simulate the world, uh, the world that the robot is going to operate in as, as accurately as possible, as close as possible to the real world, so that you can feed life experience or data into the AI computer in order to produce a good brain. Before we put this brain into the, the actual robot computer, you want to make sure that this, this brain operates properly. We need to test it inside a simulated world. So in order to create these new systems, we essentially need these three computers. You need the simulation computer, which is the environment in which the AI brain is going to learn. You need the AI factory computer that is going to produce the brain from, from that simulation environment. And then finally, you have the computer that actually operates the, the physical robot where, where you upload the brain that's produced from the AI factory onto it. Yeah. Well, and, and because of the immense amount of compute uh, that's needed, it's no coincidence that one of the early implementations of NVIDIA GPUs and Rockwell's systems are in our mobile robots, right? Being able to perceive the environment, being able to plan the route, being able to send that information up. And so it's an opportunity for us to learn uh, how to do that processing and uh, it uh, in a in a pretty advanced, uh, you know, neck of the automation woods, if you will. And I think that's just going to expand because if you can collapse the number of separate compute surfaces that you're using in automation problems, you're simplifying, you know, and if you can still get the performance and you can introduce the autonomy that you mentioned so that it's not just closing a loop of inputs, logic, and outputs, but you're also being able to learn and to be more performant with time, then uh, that's pretty exciting, and we see that as a, as a real opportunity. Now, I think the, um, the other aspect of this, of course, is the, uh, the workforce um, uh, capabilities, because what we've seen in some early implementations of Emulate 3D is you need to, as a manufacturer, do it like you mean it. If you take somebody who's you know, in their day job programming in traditional ways, um, programmable controllers and you're not giving them the time and the resource and the enablement to get comfortable in the simulation environment, you're not going to move as fast as you would like to. And we see that, you know, in multiple locations. And so really taking the right steps to enable the workforce to be comfortable with this technology is important. I'm sure you see that all the time. Yeah, I think um, in, in terms of this technology, it's, it's really unique in the uh, history of computing in that uh, the more advanced this technology gets, the easier it is to use. That hasn't been true 
for most of the other technologies that preceded it. What you were speaking about earlier with using natural language to, to help with programming um, through logics and, and uh, computing languages, up until, up until recently, uh, if you want to write a computer program, tell a computer what to do, you have to, you have to study a lot. You have to go do a lot of work to understand how a computer works, how computer languages work, and how to make them do these things correctly. Uh, but we've, we're in an era now where we can speak to a computer with natural language, tell it what to do, and it translates our intentions into an actual program. It's not perfect yet, but it's actually pretty good already. And it's getting better and better. And it's not going to be long until, essentially, Every person on Earth is going to be a computer programmer because they can program just by instructing a computer in the way they talk to any other, any other human, any other agent that walks amongst us. So uh, I think it, this is the right time for everybody to take a step back and look at what does, what does your company, your uh, your systems, your products look like in the context of a world where essentially everybody in your company, everybody participating is a programmer. They can program anything, any complex system by, by instructing it just like you would in a team of engineers, computer science engineers. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, as we embark on our respective journeys, everybody's starting from a different place, it's really important to build the right team because domain expertise, the understanding of the applications and what you're really trying to get to in your process still matters. The pieces don't just fit together without some direction and building that team with the right people internally as well as externally um, is important and you know, that's an additional reason to be excited about this partnership you know, as two leaders in this space working together and uh, finding new opportunities to add real value in real time is, uh, is something that we're very excited about. I, I think that's a really important point. I can't stress that enough. You know, up until pretty recently, when people uh, would come up to me and say, what should my, my child study in college and university? Typically, I tell them, computer science, at least as a minor, because no matter what you do, it would be very useful to be able to understand how a computer works and translate what you need into, into a computer program to help you build tools for that thing. Nowadays, I think that's not good advice. Uh, what's more valuable is having that domain experience you're talking about. So I tell them, have them go study material science or, or physics, fluid dynamics, um, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and medicine. Things that, that uh, uh, are important in the real world around us and go deep in that because we're essentially going to have an unlimited number of computer scientists and computer programmers to help you. There, of course, there's still going to be a need for computer scientists like me uh, to build the, the systems that will produce the virtual computer scientists we can all take advantage of. But the value of the domain knowledge is, is now uh, far, far greater than the knowledge on how to program a computer, how to build a computing system. Uh, that's going to be taken care of for, for everyone, so we can go deeper into each domain. Yeah. Still a big role for people as uh, we do create the future, right? So, Rev, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend a few minutes with you today, and uh, for everybody, stay tuned. More to come. Thank you so much. Yeah.